Okay, so we're recording now, and today's Bible study is on the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, and a couple of comments that the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers uh, made to Jesus about wanting to see proof. They wanted signs. Give us signs. So we're going to start with the feeding of the 5,000. Um, if you want to take the packet that has the four pages together, I would recommend that you take them apart so they're not stapled so you can lay them out in front of you. That's how I have them up here for myself. I have a, just that packet, just the multiplication of the 5,000. Lay them out in front of you, and then you'll be able to see and compare um, the gospel stories together. One thing that's important, though, anytime we're studying scripture, really is to look at what's going on around it. What happened right before, what's coming up after. So in all of the cases, the multiplication of the loaves for the 5,000 people happened before the multiplication of the 4,000. All right? So um, for, th for the first miracle, there were 5,000 men in attendance, and it says not counting the women and children. So that's the one we're going to be looking at first. That's the one that's in all four Gospels. The other one occurs in uh, Matthew and Mark only. Um, so let's take a look. If you do have your Bible, you can, you can flip back. Let's start with Matthew. Uh, if you can find it in Matthew uh, chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to tell you what's before and after. And you'll just have to take our word for it. So in Matthew chapter 14, um, right around verse 13, there's a heading that says, The Return of the Twelve and the Feeding of the Five Thousand. So my first question there is, return from where? Where were they? What was going on? Glad they're back. But what did they miss while they were gone, too? So we have to go back actually a few chapters in Matthew to find out where they were. Uh, if you spot it before I do, let me know. Okay, chapter 10. So we're going from Matthew chapter 14 back to Matthew chapter 10. And it says, The Mission of the Twelve. Then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, uh, the uh, Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So Jesus sends them out. Um, the next part is the commissioning of the twelve. We're not going to go through all that because we're going to focus on the loaves and fishes. But if you want a little bit more background, that would be kind of fun to read later. So basically, Jesus sent them out on a mission. Everything you've seen me doing and teaching and saying, and, and you go do it. Go do it. So they went out. Now, it's kind of interesting um, what comes next. We have messages from John the Baptist. We have uh, Jesus' testimony to John. We have some parables. Uh, we have some healings. Um, we have uh, the demand for a sign that shows up there once in uh, chapter 12, verse 38. Uh, we'll get back to that, so don't, don't dwell on that yet. Um, we have Jesus explaining the purpose of parables. Why is he speaking in parables? Um, so lots of things going on here before we get back to um, the loaves and fishes. So if you, would turn, if you have your Bible and you want to follow along in your Bible, the nice thing is you can look at the footnotes at the bottom. Okay? So we're going to start with Matthew chapter 14, verse, verses 13 to 21. So now we kind of know who the, who the 12, where the 12 have been. 
They've been out doing ministry. Jesus has sent them out. But now they've just come back. Um, interestingly enough, if you just look at your papers and you look at the titles across there, it's only Matthew and Luke that mention the return of the 12. Okay? Um, but those two are very much aligned with each other. Also, what happened right before the multiplication of loaves and fishes is the death of John the Baptist. And that's pretty consistent as we read all four Gospels. Um, Herod had arrested John and put him in prison because John was telling Herod that for him to marry his brother's wife was wrong, go figure. And Herod didn't like that. However, he really did seem to enjoy chatting with John when John was in prison. He would go and talk with him, and uh, John would tell him things, and Herod would sit listening. So he, he had kind of a fondness for John, even though uh, John said something he didn't like. Okay. Well, then there came a great uh, festival, and I don't recall offhand what the festival is, but um, the wife of Herod, um, her daughter danced for him, danced a beautiful dance. And Herod said to her, that was so beautiful. I will give you anything. And she asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So he had John beheaded. Because he couldn't go back on his word. He had said, I'll give you whatever you want. And she asked for what was near impossible, but he gave it to her. All right, so that has just happened. In fact, even in the same chapter, okay? Death of John the Baptist. It says his disciples came and took away the corpse and buried him, and they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, I'm on verse 13 now, right at the very beginning. When Jesus heard of it, now if we had just started our story there, we'd say, heard of what? So it's important, when questions like that come up when you're studying scripture, to take a step back and see what they're talking about, okay? When Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about five thousand, were about five thousand men, not counting women and children. So we know there were women and children in the crowd too, but they were, this is just a rough count. Now when they say 5,000, you know that they didn't have everybody count off. You know it's an estimated number, right? Um, but it tells us that was quite a large crowd, okay? Not like your typical dinner party where you might be able to scrounge up a little something from the cupboard. They make it a point to tell us that they're in a deserted place. This is far from the towns. This is far away from everything. Um, any, any comments about the Matthew version as we read it? Are you noticing anything? Is anything missing? Yes. Yes. In one of in one of the versions, we're going to find that Andrew has an answer for him, and that is the Gospel of John. And in that one, where did they get the five loaves and the two fish? From uh, a young boy in the crowd. Right, a little boy had them and offered them. Um, now in another one, let's see which one it is here. I 
another disciple is named in one of the others. Yeah, we'll find it. We'll find it as, as we get through here. Okay. Um, okay. There are some notes here that we, that we want to notice. Most of these are going to come with the Gospel of John. But I wanted you to notice there is no little boy in Matthew's version. Okay? Um, it doesn't mean there was no little boy. Okay? It just means Matthew didn't, didn't care to mention where it came from. That didn't matter. What mattered was that this is all they had. That's one thing you'll find in common through all of all four, um, all four versions of the loaves and fishes. There are five loaves and two fish. Okay, that is the same throughout all of them. So the number seems to be important. They want you to know. You know. Um, you know. When I was younger, I remember some people used to say that the miracle was that Jesus just got people to share what they had. That's not what happened here. Not what happened here, okay? Um, for one thing, we have something that we call uh, multiple attestation. So there are multiple sources saying the same thing, which makes it more believable, okay? Um, so this is one of those situations where we don't see this as an exaggeration. We don't see this as a parable of sorts. We see this as an actual miracle. There were only five loaves and two fish. And somehow, that's beyond scientific or natural explanation, Jesus took those and multiplied them so that more than 5,000 people got enough to eat. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, they all ate and were satisfied. Now, the interesting thing is that they had so much left over. They picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets full. Okay, besides the question of where did they get 12 wicker baskets, um, the question is, how did they have so much leftover? They started with five loaves and two fish. You could put those all in one wicker basket. But they have this much left over. Any thoughts on, the, on that, on the leftovers? Okay. I think the fact that 12 would represent the 12 Right, so the 12 wicker baskets likely is representative of the 12 apostles, okay? Um, and we use the term disciple and apostle with these 12. Disciples are those who follow the teacher. They're still learning. The apostles are the ones who are sent out, sent out on mission. And since they just got back from a mission that Jesus sent them out on, I suppose either, either term here is fine. So... Um, I wonder what they're supposed to do with these wicker baskets. Yes? Absolutely. Another example of God's giving in great abundance. So not, not only was there enough that everybody didn't starve to death, they ate and were satisfied, but even that wasn't enough for God. We have these 12 wicker baskets left over. So there was no question that everybody got plenty to eat and more like the wine from last week, the wine at Cana. Too bad they didn't have the wine with them. That would have made a pretty good meal, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So let's take, we can come back to this, uh, but I wanted to move on to Mark. Let's see what Mark has to say. Notice for what's the same and what's different. Okay. We're on Mark chapter 6, verses 34 to 44. That's a couple verses longer than Matthew. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. By now it was already late, and his disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place and it is already very late. Dismiss them so that we can go to the surrounding farms and villages and, and buy themselves something to eat. He said to them in reply, give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, are we to buy 200 days wages worth of food and give it to them to eat? He asked of them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. 
so he gave orders to have them sit down in groups on the green grass. The people took their places in rows by hundreds and by fifties. Then, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 wicker baskets full of fragments and what was left of the fish. Those who ate of the loaves were 5,000 men. Okay, aside from my typo there at the beginning, um, what do you notice that is different? There's very much similar. What is different? Look at what Jesus is doing with the people at the beginning. In Matthew, he, it says, he disembarked and saw the vast crowd. His heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. Now we move over to, to Mark, and it says, when he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So in Matthew, Jesus is healing their sick, and in Mark, he's teaching them many things. That doesn't mean that one of these is right and one is wrong. So sometimes when people read scripture and they find things that are different, it troubles them. Don't, do not let your hearts be troubled. Um, the scriptures are mysterious, but each writer wrote from his own perspective, okay? So to Matthew, maybe he was impressed by Jesus' curing the sick. Maybe Mark's ears were tuned in a little bit more to what Jesus was saying and teaching. And so that's what they wrote about. Um, and in, when we get to John, he wants to bring that little boy in there, right? Um, so each one has a little bit of a different lean. Like, like if something, okay, all right, let's say, let's say a big clown walked in the door here right now, and he, and he was carrying a big bundle of 15 brightly colored balloons, and he had big floppy shoes on and a big purple nose and giant ears, all right? And I asked you all to write the story down about what happened, okay? Some of you might be focused on that big bundle of balloons. Some of you might think, well, the color of the nose was odd. Usually it's red, why would it be purple? Some of you might be thinking, those shoes were so loud I couldn't think, you know? We're each gonna have a different something that we focus on. We all tell the story about the big giant clown walking in, but it's gonna sound a little bit different from each of our perspectives. Similar with the Gospels. They're telling the story as they recall it, as they see it, um, with the slant towards the audience they're writing to and from their own perspective, okay? So keep that in mind when you see differences. It's perfectly normal for there to be some differences like this. Yes? I just want to share that we had a similar experience uh, at work in which we had to see a video and everybody was to write what happened in this video, just kind of short. And a uh, gorilla walked on the stage and off. And there were 15 people. Only one person saw the gorilla. Wow. <laughs> a big, huge, uh, you know, guy dressed in a gorilla suit walked across the stage. There were uh, 15 of us. Only one saw the gorilla. <laughs> we had to go back and see it again, and even then, some people did not see that gorilla. It was the third time that they saw the gorilla. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so this, for, the, for the sake of the recording, the story that's being relayed is that at a workplace, all the employees were required, and I'm probably going to tell it differently because it's the yeah, second person here. Um, so all the employees were required to watch a video, and afterwards they wrote what they saw in the video. Um, apparently, during the video, um, a, a gorilla walked across the stage, and only one person wrote that in their story. Um, and it took until the third time before most people were starting to see the gorilla. So that's another example of uh, how we see things differently and we focus in on different things. 
that's the one really cool thing about having four gospels three of them are very similar to each other and their sources are similar in fact they even use each other as sources which is why Matthew Mark and Luke sound so much alike sometimes and John was kind of doing his own thing so Matthew Mark and Luke are writing about Jesus the human being on earth here and what he did and what he said and John wants us to know that he's from heaven and so that's John's emphasis so anyway that that's for another Bible story but just to provide some perspective as to why things may be different and thank you for sharing that okay another thing about the mark and story that I think is really important first verse when Jesus says they were like sheep without a shepherd okay here we see the Good Shepherd starting to form so what does he do he gave orders to have them sit down in groups on the green grass okay they took their place in rows by 50s and so on so the Good Shepherd is making them the lie down in green pastures he has them recline I don't know if it uses the word recline in here but reclining doesn't mean they're taking a nap they would recline to eat so I just see the Good Shepherd starting to starting to fill in here okay anything else on the mark story or comparison between Matthew and Mark okay let's take a look at Luke then this one also says the return of the 12 and notice in the first verse it uses the term Apostles when the Apostles returned they explained to him what they had done he took them and withdrew in private to a town called Bethsaida so now we have a location the crowds meanwhile learned of this and followed him he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who needed to be cured as the day was drawing to a close the twelve approached him and said dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the surrounding villages and farms and find lodging and provisions for we are in a deserted place here he said to them give them some food yourselves they replied five loaves and two fish are all we have unless we ourselves go and buy food for all these people now the men there numbered about five thousand then he said to his disciples have them sit down in groups of about fifty they did so and made them all sit down then taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven he said the blessing over them broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd they all ate and were satisfied and when the leftover fragments were picked up they filled 12 wicker baskets okay anything different about Luke anything new yes Frida and so it sounds like he took it from Matthew and Mark doesn't it except Matthew was written after Luke Mark was the first gospel written Luke probably second and then Matthew followed by John so maybe Matthew abbreviated okay yes yes Luke is okay good point so Luke is the same gospel where the where the narrative of Jesus's birth the nativity is in the gospel of Luke and it seems that it may have more detail in in this this translation although it has um, fewer verses um, but I noticed like verse 17 is a combination of what Matthew used for, for verses 20 and 21 so he consolidated verses a little bit um, there is something very Eucharistic about this too listen to the wording taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven he said the blessing over them broke them and gave them to the disciples right 
sound like mass? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you can almost see these people sitting in pews out there on the grass. They're sitting in groups of 50 to 100, okay, in organized groups so that, so that the food could be distributed. All right. All three of those say they all ate and were satisfied. All of them say the leftover fragments filled 12 wicker baskets. All right. Now let's take a look at the Gospel of John. This one is going to be very similar and yet very different. This one is simply called the multiplication of the loaves. The others all say feeding of the 5,000. So think about that. Jesus fed 5,000 people, and that was miraculous. But John is going to say it differently. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes. So I had a student ask me one time, she said, so are we supposed to actually believe this really happened? I said, yes, we are. As I mentioned to you, the multiple attestation, for one, it occurs in all four Gospels, okay? Um, this is something that is referenced a number of times afterwards. So it's clear that it happened, and they want us to remember. There's certain points that are made here that we're supposed to remember. So in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, let, me let me read it first. This is 15 verses. This is the longest one um, by a few verses. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. It's also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was perform performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him because he knew himself what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew to the mountain alone. Okay, so we still have the multiplication of loaves and fishes, 5,000 fed, 12 baskets left over. Um, what's different about this one? They mention the mountain. I'm sorry? They mention the mountain. Okay, they, they, mentioned, they mentioned the Sea of Galilee, uh, uh, Sea of Tiberias. They said that he went up a mountain. Yes, Jesus leaves them at the end. That's interesting. The others don't do that. Um, it says they, they, were coming to, they were going to come and carry him off to make him king. Okay, so some people recognized who Jesus was, and some people didn't. And the ones who thought that they recognized him, that he is truly the king of kings, the Messiah, they didn't quite understand what that was going to look like. Okay, They expected that he was going to come in and wipe out the Romans and free them from the Roman oppression, and uh, he was going to literally be a king in Jerusalem. And that's not what Jesus had in mind. You know, when he died on Calvary, they were like, wait, we thought 
But what happened? They didn't understand that his mission was much bigger than freeing a group of people from uh, temporary oppression by their enemies. It was to free us from sin and death. And so um, but these misunderstandings frequently led to uh, Jesus being in trouble with somebody, especially in the Gospel of John. So they saw what he did. They said, oh, this is him. We've got to follow him. We're going to make him king. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. That's not, that's not how this works. And so he disappeared. There were a couple of times that um, they wanted to make him king, and he just disappeared. Okay, um, notice they mentioned Passover. This is unusual. This doesn't happen in the other three Gospels. Um, I wonder why they're mentioning Passover. Yes? Could be because that's why there was such a large crowd. Oh, that's, that's very good. Perhaps that's why there was such a, loud cr a large crowd. Uh, maybe they were gathered because of Passover, so they were all in the area and were listening to Jesus. That could be. Um, there's also a very, a very close connection between Passover and what Jesus did here with the loaves and fishes. Um, Moses didn't have fish, but God gave him manna from heaven. And one thing that follows the Gospel of John is the um, bread of life discourse. When he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he says, I am the bread of life. Okay, That comes shortly after this miracle. All right, so we have here um, Passover mentioned. Okay, If you don't know the story of Passover, just a real quick, real quick overview for anybody who doesn't know that story. Um, Moses had encountered God in the burning bush. God had revealed himself by the name I am who am. All right? uh, Moses goes back into Egypt where he's a wanted man, and he, there are ten plagues, ten plagues in Egypt, each one uh, overthrowing one of the Egyptian gods. So that's an interesting study too. So um, Moses is there in Egypt. The tenth plague, of course, is... Um, that the firstborn of each household will die. And it's a sad thing. But God tells Moses, he said, tell the people this. They're to take a lamb, a perfect unblemished lamb, not the old crippled one, okay? Take the perfect unblemished lamb, and you're going to sacrifice it. You're going to have its flesh for dinner. You're going to smear the blood around the doorpost, and when the angel of death passes over, which is where the term Passover came from, uh, when the angel of death passes over, it'll see the blood on your door, and the blood of the lamb will save you. Okay? So we have the blood of the lamb saving them. And what are they doing? They're inside eating the flesh of the lamb, the lamb of God, right? So we can make that connection from where we are, looking back and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. All right, so after that last plague, Egypt is tired of this. They said, fine, just take your people and get out of here. Then they change their mind. They pursue them in the desert and then the Red Sea and all the horses and chariots and charioteers are killed in the sea when they try to pursue God's people. But the people complained to Moses a lot in the desert. Moses, have you brought us out here to die? We have no water. We have no food and so on and so forth. We're tired of bread. We want meat, you know. And they just kept complaining. And at one point, uh, Moses says to God, the people are going to kill me here, you know. They need food. We've run out of the food we brought. They need food. So God sends manna from heaven. The word manna actually means, what is it? There, were, there was nothing known to them. There was not like, oh, yeah, I saw that once before. No, they had not seen anything like it. But it was like, um, I've not seen it myself, but I'm picturing uh, like little oatmeal flakes all over the place. Um, but they were such that um, the people could use them to make bread, scoop them up, make, make like flour, make bread out of them. Um, they could eat them just directly. It was kind of sweet, it says in scripture. Um, and the people could really use it however they wanted for food. But the deal was they were learning to trust in God. And that meant they could only take one day's collection of this, of this manna. If they tried to 
you know, maybe God won't provide for us tomorrow, so maybe I'll take extra. We'll just store up, you know, wicker baskets full of it. They couldn't because it would get buggy immediately after nightfall. God would not let them keep it beyond one day, except when the Sabbath was approaching, and then they could collect two days' worth, and it would remain good. All right? So as Moses uh, was credited for giving the people manna, uh, in the desert, although God is the one who actually provided it. Now Jesus is providing bread in the desert. Well, it, we have green green grass here in a number of places, but it's, it's uh, similar to Moses providing the manna in the desert, God providing the manna in the desert through Moses, rather, and Jesus now providing the bread for the people to eat. And as God is God, God is always generous, and so... Uh, in Moses' day, the people got just enough to feed them for the day. And in this one, we see the abundance of God again. Um, and Jesus is doing the work of God. God is not working through him, but Jesus is doing it. Whereas Moses prayed to God and said, God, they're hungry, do something, and God sent manna. In this case, Jesus is not the intermediary. He's the one with the power to do this. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions, comments? Yes? Uh, the description of the bread violates versus what other kind of bread did they eat at that time? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what else they would have eaten as far as types of bread, but one of the notations in uh, the footnotes of one of these Bibles I'm using up here um, mentions that barley, barley loaves are food of the poor. So um, that's significant. Um, this this little boy probably brought you know all he all he had i don't know if his family was there with him or if he's out wandering the hillsides in the wilderness by himself i would expect his family was there too um but he comes up and he offers all they have so it's it's like um l let me let me take a trip back here a moment um give me one second i'll find it um, John, John, John. There is a story in the Old Testament that this echoes very much. John 6. If anybody else spots it first, let me know. Okay, let's try Ezekiel 16. Let's see where that takes us. Not the one I'm looking for. All right. Um, I'll find it. Um, there's a story of a prophet, um, Elijah, the prophet Elijah. And he approached a, a poor widow who had a son, and he asked her for some water. And she went and she got him some water. And then when she came back, he said, and could you fix me, fix me a cake? Uh, a cake would be like a, a loaf of bread type thing. Fix, fix me some food. So she said, actually, I'm gathering up some firewood. I'm going to build a fire, and I was just going to cook what we have left for my son and I, and then we will die. Meaning, I have nothing. I have nothing to offer. The very last food that we have we're going to eat, and there is no more because there was a drought. So she had no hope of you know, going to the market and getting more grain or anything. And he says, fix it for me anyway. God will provide. And so she does, and she mixes him up barley, a barley loaf, okay? And she gives it to him, and Elijah promises her that until this drought is over, until this famine is over, her oil and her flour will not run dry. And they did not, and it continued. So, and there were other miracles in there too, but the barley, the, the barley loaf go, echoes back to that Old Testament story. Okay, thanks for bringing it up. Sorry I couldn't find it exactly. 
Um, if you check your footnotes in the Gospel of John, it may mention it in there somewhere. Okay. Um, a couple of them mention the amount that it would cost to feed all these people. Mark and John mentioned 200 days wages. So a day's wage was a denarii. Um, so 200 days wages. Imagine that. 200, think about how much money you make in 200 days. So 200 days, that's uh, half a year. That's more than half a year, right? That's a lot of money to feed all those people. Not to mention, how are you going to transport all that food if you could buy it? How is it? There's, there'd have to be trucks pulling up the hillside, right? That's a huge amount of money, uh, money and food. And yet, Jesus does this easily with leftovers. Plenty left over. Okay. So, again, all of these have the 12 wicker baskets. A um, couple other things I'm going to mention in here. Um, one of the verses here in John, it says, uh, let me see, verse 6, it says, he said this to test him because he knew him, he himself knew what he was going to do. One of the things about the Gospel of John and the way it's written, Jesus is always in control of the situation. Even his crucifixion, Jesus is in control. He's pretty much telling Pilate what's going to happen, okay? Um, not so in the other Gospels. You know, they show Jesus as a human being, and he's about to die, and he's afraid. The Gospel of John doesn't ever show Jesus being afraid. It shows him as in control. So why is he asking Philip then? Um, it's a, he, it, to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. The apostles have not seen this before. Jesus has not done this before. Um, what immediately follows this multiplication of the loaves and the fishes is Jesus walking on water. Okay, this is showing that Jesus had dominion over nature. He's out there walking on the water. This is huge. So if you're not if you're not getting who Jesus is just in this one chapter, you know, you're not paying attention, right? All right. Let's set the feeding of the 5000 aside and I want to take a look at the uh, feeding of the 4000. And let's see what is the same or different. Now, I have to tell you, scripture scholars do not agree on whether or not there were two different occasions or if we're talking about the same thing and describing it differently, okay? My personal opinion is I tend to think it happened twice, and I'll show you why as we're going through. Now, the multiplication, the feeding of the 4,000, is only in Matthew and Mark. So let's look at Mark first, since Mark was the one um, that was likely written first. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. In those days, when there again was a great crowd without anything to eat, he summoned the disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd, because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will collapse on the way, and some of them have come a great distance. His disciples answered him, Where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? Still he asked them, How many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said the blessing over them and ordered them distributed also. They ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets. There were about 4,000 people. 
he dismissed them and got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you think this is describing the same, di the same incident, and then I'm going to ask you if you think it's a different incident. Raise your hand if you think they're describing the same incident, maybe just differently. Okay, is it a different incident? Okay, pretty unanimously, you guys think it's a different inc incident. It does say there again was a great crowd. Okay, so that makes you think, huh, okay. Um, the number of people is different. And it doesn't say just the men, it says 4,000 people total. So this might be a significantly smaller crowd even. So if we had 5,000 men, not counting women and children, I mean, that crowd could easily grow to 15,000 pretty easily uh, if you had a wife and a child with each of them. Um, so here we have 4,000 gathered people. All right. Um, now what happened, let's look at what happened right before in Mark. What's going on right before that? The healing of the deaf man. What was it? Healing of the deaf man. Okay, healing of a deaf man. Let's see, Mark 8. So we have the healing of a deaf man, the Syrophoenician woman's faith. We looked at both of those stories already. Uh, before that, we have the tradition of the elders. Um, they were concerned about um, hand washing and those kinds of things, the ritual things of the Pharisees. Healings at Gennesaret, walking on water, feeding of the 5,000, and the return of the 12, in, in that reverse order I just said. Okay. So this clearly happens afterwards. Same thing in Matthew. It happens after the, after the 5,000. So one of the theories is that, you know, little scraps of things were written down and then they were gathered together to, to be written into a book, so to speak. Um, and so like we have multiple blind men being heal healed. Were, did Jesus heal multiple blind men or was it one and they told the story lots of times? Um, I think we have evidence for lots of healings, okay? Um, why not? Why not a couple of incidents of the multiplication of loaves and fish? Um, it's hard to tell for sure. Um, there are some who say it's just being retold with a different uh, emphasis. So in Mark, it says Jesus is trying to get the disciples to figure out what to do here, right? In the, in, in the feeding of the 5,000, they were frustrated. Well, what do you want us to do? That's like two, 200 days wages. You want, you know, they're telling Jesus what to do. Send the crowds away. Remember, they started, started with that. Send them away so they can go find food on their own. And that's when Jesus turns it around and says, you feed them. All right? Now, here they're presented with another opportunity. And Jesus is saying, it's like real similar. It's like deja vu. Let's see if they get it this time. My heart is moved with pity for the crowd because they've now they've been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they'll collapse on the way, and some of them have come a great distance. Did the disciples say, well, hey, Jesus, remember what you did last time? No. They say, where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? So one of the reasons that some scripture scholars believe this to be a repeat of the other story is surely they would have, they would have known that Jesus could have done something here. Instead, they say, where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them? When the 5,000 5, were fed, it says, everybody ate and all were satisfied. And now just, what, two chapters later, they're saying, where would, we get, where would we get enough bread? Interesting. So there are reasons for looking at it both ways. We don't really know. Um, yes, seven baskets instead of 12. Why seven? Yes. Maybe the sacraments. Ooh, sacraments. That's a good guess. That's a good guess. Seven is a number that's, um, it's, it's a number of completeness, okay? Uh, it's, it's like, um, oh, I'm trying to think how to put this. Uh, like seven days in a week, creation was completed in seven days. 
Um, seven is a number often used in scripture to show completeness, okay? Where is the 12? Maybe that was a mission. Here's your baskets. What are you going to do with them? Go, you know? And I would expect that the more they, the more they gave, the more they received, the more those baskets refilled. Um, I, have a, I have a little thing that I do with my First Communion kids when we do this story. And I take, I take a small wicker basket, like um, a, a serving bowl size, and I fill it with a, with a small, like a kitchen towel, two of them. Uh, one of them I just lay down back and forth and make layers, and uh, the other one lays on top and folds over. So what I do is I, I, I buy something like goldfish crackers, and I sprinkle them in the basket between the layers, but on top, all they're going to see are two or three fish, okay? So I gather all the children around me, and we sit down. I set the basket on the floor in the middle of us. I ask them, how many of you would like a snack? Oh, they all do. They all do. Their hands are up. They're excited, but then they look at the basket. Like, Mrs. Smith, we're, we're not, we're not going to have enough. They don't say anything, but you can see it in their eyes, and they're all thinking, but I want one. And so I say, before we, before we share our, our meal, we should say grace, right? We're going to say thank you to God. And so I make a big deal of, you know, um, saying grace for God's bounty, for giving us this food to share. And the kids are a little anxious. You could see it. I imagine the people gathered here were anxious. You know, they're starting to hand out the food, but I'm sitting in the back. Wow, I'm probably not going to get any. I hope I, I hope I do. I'm hungry, you know. So as I walk around to the children, I reach in the basket. I make sure they can see it every now and then so they know there's only a couple of fish left. And I reach underneath the towel where they can't see, and I hand them a couple of fish. And then I move to the next one, and they're looking like, wow. In the end, I tell them, sometimes they figure it, figure it out by the end, sometimes not. Um, so by the end, everybody's gotten some, and I asked, did everybody get fish? Okay, everybody got them, good. And then I take the basket, and I pour it into another basket, and they can see how many there are now, and then they're like, oh, I know what you did. And then I explained, what I did was a trick, right? We just had some fun with this. This is a trick. But what Jesus did was for real. They only had five loaves and two fish, or in this case, seven loaves. Um, now it's interesting, he fed less people with more bread here, with more loaves. He started with seven, and they only had five in the other one. So maybe this is, um, this is a, a, a reminder to the disciples that I'm giving you everything you need. This is complete. I don't know. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. In this, um, it talks about they were with him for three days, and then they were so did they not eat anything for three days till the third day? Or? Well, that's a good question. It does mention that they didn't eat anything for three days. So some of the people might have brought brought well, some it snacks didn't with say them. They didn't eat anything. It just said they were with him for three days. So did right. they have food before that? And then, you know, I mean, who knows? Did they run out? Yeah. Right. Um, gosh, you know, maybe you wonder even if they finished up those 12 baskets that were left over from a couple chapters ago. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we don't know if the crowd, I mean, if they knew they were going to be following Jesus, maybe they packed up a picnic lunch and people are bringing these, these lunches with them, uh, thinking, okay, well, we're going to need lunch and dinner and then we'll head home. Then they end up staying for another day and then another day. And, I, you know, if we had a chance to listen to Jesus, would you want to go home? No. No, no. And so we do, every time we read the scriptures, we get to hear him. Every time we go to Mass, we get to be with him and hear him. So, yeah, um, I don't know about you, but I can't get enough. So I, I, love, I love the Bible study with you all because I love reviewing it myself. It feeds me too. So I'm really glad you guys are wanting to do this, you ladies. All right, so we don't know what happened to them for those first few days food-wise. If Maybe they had some food and they used it up or... Or maybe they were just so absorbed in listening to Jesus, they just really didn't care, you know, just completely focused. But now Jesus is aware that they're not going to make it home. They're just going to collapse on the way, be so hungry, and just fall apart. And he doesn't want to see that. Um, again, Jesus has mercy on the, pe on the people. 
His heart is moved, moved with pity for the crowd. Um, he wants to take care of them. He is the good shepherd. He wants to take care of them. Let's look at Matthew, which would have been written after Mark. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. These ones are much shorter than the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Jesus summoned his disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd, for they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry for fear they may collapse on the way. The disciples said to him, Where could we ever get enough bread in this deserted place to satisfy such a crowd? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and a few fish. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks, broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets full. Those who ate were 4,000 men, not counting women and children. And when he had dismissed the crowds, he got into the boat and came to the district of Magadan. Very similar to the Mark story, is it not? In fact, at first glance, I'm not even noticing any differences. Looks very much the same. Okay. I want to mention, if we go back to, if we go back to Mark chapter 8, the verse immediately following the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, you don't have to turn back if you're someplace else. So Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. As soon as they've done the feeding of the 4,000, the very next thing in the same chapter is the demand for a sign. The Pharisees came forward and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. He sighed from the depth of his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Amen, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got into the boat again, and went off to the other shore. Now something else interesting follows. Okay, He's now in the boat with his disciples, having fed 5,000, and then 4,000. Now they're in the boat. They had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. So I guess they don't have those 12 wicker baskets anymore, or the seven even. He enjoined them, watch out, guard against the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They concluded among themselves that it was because they had no bread. When he became aware of this, he said to them, why do you conclude that it is because you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or comprehend? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and not see, ears and not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the, fi for the 5,000, how many wicker baskets full of fragments you picked up? They answered him, 12. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of fragments did you pick up? They answered him, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? There's one more thing that follows in that same chapter. Well, a number of things, but the next one is the blind man of Bethsaida. And this is one where it takes Jesus two two times to, to give him a complete healing. In the Gospel of Mark, remember everything you're reading in here, Mark is hiding the messianic secret, okay? Um, so that nobody quite gets it, not even the disciples. The blind man at Bethsaida was partially healed, but maybe not enough faith for a full healing. 
he came back and it took a second, a, kind of a second dose of healing for him. Um, it says, putting spittle on his eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, do you see anything? Looking up, he replied, I see people looking like trees and walking. Then he laid hands on his eyes a second time and he could see clearly. So the Gospel of Mark is all about Jesus being there and telling them and showing them and them not quite seeing and hearing and believing. Okay? So I found that interesting. Immediately after the 4,000, they're looking for a sign. It's like, hello, did, did you, are you not paying attention? Um, let's go to Mark, uh, Matthew rather, and see what precedes Matthew. Or, I'm sorry, what follows Matthew. So Matthew 16. We had the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 14. The feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, we have again the demand for a sign. The Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test him, asked, the, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He said to them in reply, in the evening you say, Tomorrow will be fair, for the sky is red. And in the morning, tomorrow will be, oh, today will be stormy, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to judge the, judge the appearance of the sky, but you cannot judge the signs of the times. An evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. Does anybody know what the sign of Jonah is? The three days in the belly of the fish, yes. So like Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish, Jesus will spend three days in the heart of the earth before he's raised. So when he talks about the sign of Jonah, he mentions it a couple of times. Um, I don't remember the other one is offhand, but a couple of times Jesus does mention um, no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah. And in one, um, he even says that. It's spelled out uh, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Okay. Um, but look at what happened with Jonah. Jonah was a reluctant prophet. He's the one, God said, go to Nineveh. What does Jonah do? He gets in a ship heading the other direction. Okay. It's like, no. And why did Jonah not, not want to go to Nineveh? Did he just want to disobey God? No, he hated the Ninevites. He did not want their hearts to be converted. He wanted God to just destroy them all. Send down your, your fire, your anger, just destroy the Ninevites. God said, go to the Ninevites. Go to Nineveh. Jonah ran away. So the great storm came up, and Jonah was cast into the sea, uh, partly at his own request, uh, because the, the sea was getting unmanageable and they were going to lose the ship and all were going to be lost. And everyone is praying and calling out to their gods and they turned to Jonah and said, what have you done? And he's like, well, yeah, this is probably my fault. You know, God wanted me to do something. I didn't want to do it, so I ran away and here I am. And Maybe you'd be, be, be better off just to toss me overboard. So they did. <laughs> Um, reluctantly, I'm sure, but if this is going to calm the sea and you're running away from God, we can't help you. We can't save you from God. <laughs> so um, Jonah uh, is swallowed and lives in the belly of a fish for three days. Um, sometimes sometimes we, we hear whale, but the scriptures actually say a great fish. Okay, um, And Jonah is actually kind of vomited up on the shores of Nineveh by this great fish. So of all the places he didn't want to go, uh, I imagine those three days taught him a little bit of a lesson, right? So there he is in Nineveh, and he goes through the town kind of half-heartedly, 
okay, yeah, convert your hearts or God's going to destroy you. You know, and he wouldn't have the microphone. He'd be like, oh, um, hello, can I have your attention? Okay, um, God's going God's to come and destroy you if you don't repent. Because he doesn't want them to hear the message and be converted. So what do they do, the Ninevites? They convert, they repent in sackcloth and ashes. The king is in sackcloth and ashes. Even the animals were repenting. I'm not sure what the animals had to repent about. But when you read the story, they make it clear that the entire town of Nineveh, everybody, every creature, repented and turned back to God. And Jonah's like, that's not what he wanted. That's what God wanted. Because every person counts to God. So Jesus is going to spend three days in the heart of the earth, in his grave. How many people will be converted afterwards? Many. Will the Pharisees turn to him after this? Not many. Not many. There were some Pharisees who followed Jesus. Don't misunderstand. Sometimes when we study the scriptures, we, we get a little confused. It talks about, um, like the, the early followers of Jesus were hiding for fear of the Jews. They weren't hiding from all of the Jewish people. They were Jewish people. They were hiding from those who would uh, persecute them and have them thrown in prison or executed for following Jesus. Okay? Um, the, whole, the whole thing about the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the scribes, that conflict is like a whole nother, whole nother story. We can look at it a little bit, um, a little bit uh, before we end in a couple of weeks. Yes. The Herodians, the Herodians uh, ruled before the Romans, um, but their family was still was still among them. Were they were they Jewish? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, they were Jewish, but they, you probably wouldn't find them in the temple. Okay. Um, the Jewish people um, had an idea that if you were truly Jewish, that you would be um, isolated from other people. Okay. Um, like with King Herod, who was um, a descendant of the Herodians. Um, it wasn't that way. You know, he dealt with the Romans. He had business interactions with the Romans, and that would make him not not a good candidate to be able to come into the temple area. It would make him, like, unclean. It's like the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The Samaritans, were they Jewish? Yeah, it depends on who you ask. Um, their, their roots were Jewish, and they ended up living in Samaria. Um, but to the Jew, but to the Jews in Jerusalem, they didn't consider them to be Jewish. But the Samaritans did still consider themselves to be Jewish. So it depends on what perspective. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions or comments about what we've looked at today with the five thousand and the four thousand and? There was one thing I wanted to mention on the Gospel of John with the 5,000. I just thought of it. John, okay. Um, in the Gospel of John, let me find it here. Verse 14. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet the one who is to come in the world. So um, they were looking for one like Moses, one like Moses. So Jesus had, especially, this is the Gospel of John, but in the Gospel of Matthew, there are a lot of comparisons made between Jesus and Moses, back and forth. Um, but this is a case where they're making an intentional connection with Moses here by calling him the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. They would see it as the one like Moses, like the modern day Moses for us. Um, but they use the word sign too, which I thought was pretty interesting in the Gospel of John. 
אוקיי. Okay. I would suggest that you read the Bread of Life discourse after this today. So the Bread of Life discourse, let me see Gospel of John. Multiplication of the Loaves is chapter 6. We do not have the 4,000 in uh, Luke or John. Hmm. I know it's in here. I think I passed it. Oh, okay, chapter 6. It's in the same chapter in John. So the multiplication of the loaves is, is verses 1 to 15 in chapter 6. Then we have Jesus walking on water, showing that he has power and authority over, over nature there too. And then the bread of life discourse, where he, he makes that comparison directly. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Um, it's interesting that Jesus says to his disciples, um, are your hearts hardened? This was in Mark. Remember I said, Mark, nobody gets it, right? Have your, are your hearts hardened? Do you see? Do you look and not see? Do you, do you hear but not listen? You know, how are you missing this? So Jesus is spelling out the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And he's saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So that miracle I just did with the loaves and fishes, that was a sign pointing to something greater. That bread, yeah, that, that, was, that was kind of a cool little thing I did here. But there's more. Stay tuned. And the disciples, a lot of people, they, you know, a lot of the people who were following him at that point, they saw the miracle of, of the multiplication of loaves, and they're following him like, what's he going to do next? And Jesus tells them, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And they're like, what? What do you mean, eat your flesh and drink your blood? That makes no sense. We can't do that. We can't, we can't even listen to this. And Jesus repeats it. He says, amen, I say to you. Amen means believe it. This is true. Um, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you, you have no life. And many walked away from him because they could not accept those words. And he turned to his disciples and he says, will you leave me too? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And they don't understand what Jesus is talking about either, but they follow him in faith. If he says that we need to do this, just, just stay close. This will make sense at some point. If it doesn't make sense today, that's okay. It will. We'll stay with him. They did not leave Jesus. They stayed by his side. Then at the Last Supper, imagine this. At the Last Supper, Jesus takes bread and he raises it up and he says, take and eat. This is my body given up for you. And now they're like, oh, now I get it. Okay? Through God's mercy, what was bread and wine and becomes Jesus' actual body and blood, still looks and tastes like bread and wine so that we can do what he said. The Jews were right when they said, how can we eat a person's flesh and blood? That made no sense. That sounded crazy talk, right? But Jesus had a way, and they didn't stay with him to find out what that way was. But now the disciples who've been with them all the time at the Last Supper, now they get it. And now we get it. We know where it came from. We get it. So I hope when you're at Mass, you know, maybe some of this kind of comes back to you and you're like, wow, yeah, maybe it's a little bit deeper, a little bit richer because of something that you've learned. I hope so. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Um, next week is going to be interesting. Next week we're going to be looking at... Um, Jesus demonstrates power and authority over sin and evil. So that will be different. And then our final week will be Jesus demonstrates power and authority over death. Okay. Um, so let's close with a prayer. 
and then I'm going to put a song on. You're welcome to listen or um, uh, depart as you as you need to, um, wherever you need to be. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ, you are the bread of the world. You are the Word made flesh. You are the one who came into the world that we might know God. Enter into our lives and help us to grow in our relationships with you. Help us to really know you, not just to know about you, but to live for you and be willing to die for you. Lord Jesus Christ, be our bread. Feed us. And may what we receive in the Holy Eucharist transform us so that we too may become the body of Christ. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.